Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he only knew the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. Church is not a cruise liner where we're having seven meals a day and uh, having people bring to it, stuff to us. The church is more like whitewater rafting. And, and if we get that vision, that, that sense of we're going somewhere, we're on this adventure, but if half the people aren't paddling, you're going to have a problem when you hit the rough water. We all have to be part of it. I love the picture of the church being this team together, paddling, talking to each other, communicating, going somewhere. And where, where we're going is toward Jesus. We're following Jesus. That's what we're called to do as the church. We are called to follow Jesus Christ. And, and, and so here's the, what we're talking about today. Is we're in part two of the book of Acts. As we're, we talked about, about the Holy Spirit in the books of Acts. Now we're talking about the church. What does the church look like? And today we're talking about leadership. And the moment you say leadership to people, they say, most people say, oh, that's not me. I'm not a leader or I'm certainly not a leader in the church. That's L team members, leadership team members. That's you know, teachers or, or small group leaders, but that's not me. But I want to suggest something to you. I want to suggest a bigger vision of leadership for Christians in the church. And here's what I, what I want to suggest to you. If you're walking and following Jesus, so you're walking and following Jesus, and you're seeking him and living for him and using the gifts he's given to you, and other people are watching you and walking alongside of you or following behind you, you're leading them. Get the picture? It could be your kids. It could be your nieces and your nephews. It could be your siblings. It could be, you may be a young person who's a Christian and you're pointing your parents towards Jesus. It could be people at your work or your neighborhood. But when you're following Jesus on his mission, using your gifts for his glory in whatever way it is, and other people are walking with you, you are leading them toward Jesus. And that's what God wants for us. Some of you are in a place of giving leadership in the church or leadership in other people's lives. Some of you uh, would say, you know, I, that's not what I'm doing, but I'd, I'd be open to saying, God, in a more, there's kind of formal roles of leadership, there's just living a life where people can follow alongside of you and follow you and towards Jesus. Some of you used to give leadership in God, among God's people, and you're not, but you're feeling like God's calling you back to a new place of using your gifts. So all of you need to be committed to praying for those who God puts in roles of leadership, whether it's pastors or leaders or volunteers. It doesn't matter what it is. Pray for those who are leading within the life of the church. And, and all of you, I believe, should be God's people in the world. If, you, if you've come to the cross and received Jesus Christ and you're walking with him, you are God's person wherever he sends you. And as you walk towards Jesus and people walk with you, they walk closer to Jesus Christ. In my own journey of faith, I became a Christian when I was almost 16 years old. And, and there were a number of people that God put in my life at that time that gave leadership to me. One was a guy in a formal role of leadership. His name was Dan Webster. He was a youth pastor. And Dan loved Jesus, taught the word, and I watched him. And as he walked towards Jesus, I learned from him. He was the first one who looked at me and said, Kevin, I think you have gifts of teaching. I was 16 years old. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. And he said, I think you have gifts of teaching. And he challenged me to grow those gifts. And he started training me to be a teacher and a preacher at 16 years old. I praise God for that. But another leader in my life at that time was a guy named Doug Drainville. Doug was about three or four years older than me, a college student, and he just loved Jesus and walked with Jesus, and he volunteered helping out with the, the high school kids at Garden Grove Community Church. But I watched Doug, and I studied him, and I learned from him, and as he walked with Jesus, and I hung around with him, I learned to walk with Jesus. He gave leadership in my life. And then Jan Klump. Jan was this fiery, college-age young woman, and she loved Jesus so much, and she had this way of noticing when you were slacking off or not following Jesus very well, and she'd call you out. That was her, her gift, was like calling people. She, and she, I was like the squirrely, goofy high school kid, you know, and I, she'd say, Kevin, there's so much more in you, and she was constantly challenging me to follow Jesus more, and God used her to help me follow Jesus more closely. You know, I, I, I can stand here today as a pastor and as a leader because hundreds of people in my life have shown me the way to Jesus. 
and they've walked towards Jesus, they've lived a life that honors him, they've used their spiritual gifts, and as I've walked with them or followed behind them, I've become more of who God wants me to be. And my prayer today is that you will say, somebody's watching and following me. May I walk more closely with Jesus. In a formal ministry role, great. Informally, in your walk of life. But as other people follow you, they'll actually walk more closely with Jesus. Lord Jesus, teach us today. Help us understand the specific uh, ways that you might call us to, to a formal ministry or just a place of leadership of the people around us. Make us more actively engaged in leading for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today I want to just tell you some stories from the book of Acts. I'm going to tell you five stories. And in those five stories, there's just different lessons for leaders, formal leaders or, or just kind of informal roles of leadership. And I want you to listen to each story. And I'm only going to give you like the cliff notes so that you'll go back in your Bibles and go dig in more. But I want to tell you five stories and I want to glean some lessons about leaders. Here's the first story. It's a great story. It's found in Acts chapter 6. And here, we're going to learn that leaders rise up in times of conflict. And this is the leadership of the seven, these seven leaders that are called out to a new ministry. So Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, we read this. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the church, this young church was growing now, the Hellenistic Jews, these are Jewish people who came from a more Greek Hellenistic background, but had become followers of Jesus, they saw him as the Messiah, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews. These are the Jewish people that had more of the Hebrew background, and so there was kind of a conflict within the church because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word, the preaching, in order to wait on tables to do the food ministry, the care ministry. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and full of wisdom and will turn this responsibility over to them. And we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So we learn all kinds of things in this simple little story. Here's lesson number one. If you're a note taker, there's a place to write these lessons down in your bulletin. Lesson number one. Conflict comes in the best of times. Admit it, face it, and mobilize leaders to unleash the Spirit's restoring power. When things are going really well, particularly in the church, watch out. Because the enemy doesn't like that. And conflict is going to probably start cropping in. As a leader, I'm always watching for that. Especially in the good times. You say, oh, that's negative. No, it's not negative. It's just being honest. It's just being real. When, when, when things are going well, be careful. The enemy doesn't want things to keep going well. So, so what's happening in the early church is things are going really, really well. The church is growing. But the widows, and in that time in history, there was no safety net. There was no social security. There was no way to provide for the widows. It was, it was really the role of the church. And I think in many ways the church should still be helping those in need more and more than we do. But, but, but what's happening now is, is that the, the, the widows that are part of the Hebraic background, the more Hebrew background and more, more Hebrew speaking type, they're getting their needs met more. But the ones that are more from the Grecian, um, Hellenistic, Greek background and culture aren't being cared for. So what do these two groups in the church do when they find this out? Well, they put it right with big, bold, angry letters on placards. and They yell and scream and protest each other and they divide the church, right? No! That's what we do today. Everything, like every time there's a disagreement, everybody starts protesting and yelling and screaming. They got together and talked. What a thought. Can somebody say amen? amen. You know? They got together and they talked about it. Brilliant, right? Um, and, and, and so it says the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said it would not be right. So, so they got together and they talked and they said, let's raise up leaders and make sure we can still do the preaching, but also do the physical needs of people. And they talked and they prayed and they worked together and God used that. But conflict comes in the best of times. Be ready for that. And when it happens, say, God, raise us up to meet the needs. Lesson number two. Certain qualities are essential for every leader in the church. Here's what they say. Okay, we need people. We've got people who are preaching, doing the ministry of preaching and prayer. Now we need people to do the ministry of compassion and food ministries and care ministries. So, you know, just get anyone. It doesn't matter. You know, that's not an important ministry. Just get anyone and get them, have them do it, right? No. They said, this is a big deal. In the name of Jesus, we're feeding the hungry. We're caring for the people that are in need. So so they gave these qualifications. They should be full of the Spirit. When you become a Christian, the Spirit moves into you. But they should be overflowing by walking in the presence and the power. They're full of the Holy Spirit. Full of wisdom. In other words, they know the Word of God. Our wisdom is not enough to solve the world's problems. 
but God's wisdom is always enough. So they're full of the spirit to overflowing. They're full of wisdom. They know the word of God and they're responsible. When they say they're going to show up, they show up. When they say they're going to do it, they do it. They're responsible leaders. Those are the standards for, for this, this care and compassion ministry of food for the hungry, for the widows, particularly because they got, got left out in culture at that time. So, so they said, we need to have certain qualifications. And I believe that we should all, whatever our role of leadership, look and say, am I being filled with the Spirit? Spirit of God, fill me up with compassion, with strength, with power, with faithfulness to overflowing. I want to be filled with wisdom, Lord. I'm going to read this book every day. There's a reason why every week when we gather, we open the word of God, because this is where the wisdom comes from. We don't have it on our own. There's a reason why 365 days a year, we have a reading for you in your bulletin and on our website of here's a Bible passage to read to get ready for next week's sermon, because we want you to open this book because the wisdom you need for fill in the blank, whatever you're doing, is found in here. And so, we, God, am I filled with wisdom, and am I responsible? When I make a commitment to do an act of service in the name of Jesus, do I show up and make sure I do it? Let's ask ourselves, am I growing in those qualities that God wants to see grow in me? A Shoreline Church has a leadership team. There's 12 members of the leadership team. 11 of the 12 members of your leadership team, which is our church board, are congregational members, are volunteers in the church. They do the final approval of the budget every year, the ministry teams come with their proposals, but that, that team actually says not that much, that much, and they make the final decision. They monthly oversee the finances of the church. The only member of your leadership team at Shoreline who gets to vote is me. I mean, the only, only staff member. The other 11 are congregational members, and I never vote. I always say all in favor. People say yes. All opposed say no. Now, if there was a tie, I could break the tie, but I'm not that stupid. Um, <laughs> If there's a tie, I'm going to say, let's pray for another month. <laughs> uh, but but here, here's the reality. Shoreline Church, your, your leadership team members, when we are looking for new members, we're asking questions like, are they full of the Spirit? Are they full of wisdom? Are they responsible? Do they walk closely with Jesus? And there's certain qualifications the Bible gives for leaders in the church. We look for those. But I praise God for those leaders who are overflowing with the Spirit of God. And then there's a third lesson from this, this first story. And that is that delegation and gift-based ministry are biblical to the core. Delegating certain responsibilities to certain people and gift-based ministry. So the leaders gather and they say, listen, the people that are preaching and leading prayer, that's their gifts, that's their call. So they're going to keep doing that. But now we need some people that are going to have compassion and concern for those that are needy and that'll, that'll feed the widows and help take care of their needs. We need another group of people for that. And we do that at Shoreline constantly. We have a spiritual gifts class here. If you say, well, I'm not sure where I should serve, we have a test that will help you say, oh, you have gifts of teaching and a call for teaching. Let's get you involved in teaching children or youth or adults. Oh, you have gifts of compassion. We have great care ministries. We have great community outreach ministries. And we'll help you discover your gifts and find your place because God wants us kind of fitting in the right place according to our gifting and our calling. But I believe there's a place for everyone in the church and somewhere where you can use the gifts God's given you to be a blessing here and a blessing beyond here to the world around us. So there's some lessons from the calling of the seven to that special ministry. Here's story number two. Acts chapter six, verses eight through eight, chapter, chapter eight, verse one. And here's the lesson. Leaders lay it all down for Jesus. It's the story of Stephen. Those who follow Jesus in his footsteps and lead others forward will give everything for Jesus. That's what committed leaders do. So, so in Acts uh, chapter 7, and, and here, chapter 6, verse 8, it begins, the passage begins, now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. So Stephen, one of the seven that's, that's brought on to work with the widows, what you're going to discover is it wasn't the only thing he did, caring for the widows. He was filled with wisdom and with God's word. So he starts to minister, and he becomes a target. And he becomes a target of the Sanhedrin, which is basically the high court in, the, in those days, the Jewish high court. They target him. And they call him in. And they basically say, listen, you're following this Jesus. And Jesus was against Moses and the law and against God and the temple. And they say, here's the problems with Jesus. And they had, this group had just crucified Jesus. Now they're coming after Jesus' after Jesus's followers. And they just say to Stephen, you know, what do you have to say for yourself? So Stephen, you know, well, he was just a care ministry guy, right? He was just helping provide food for the widows. Man, he walks them through their history. Read it. It's amazing. He preaches basically a sermon to them and says, let me walk you through the whole history of the people of Israel. But he doesn't just walk through their history. He points out all the worst moments of their entire history when they were rebellious and hard-hearted and misbehaved. 
It'd be like somebody saying, you, you come to somebody saying, well, I, I'm bothered by what you're doing. And they say, oh, well, let me say something to you. And they point out every wrong thing you've ever done. It just makes people love you, doesn't it? It's warm. It's kind of, you know, Stephen just, and so you got you to read this. Stephen's like, and then this happened, and then you were hard-hearted then, and our people, and he just goes through this whole story of their history. And, and as he gets to the end, and it's, it's a long, he, 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 it's a long kind of conversation, story, preaching. And in verse 51 of chapter 7, he's kind of coming to the climax of what he's saying. Listen to this. Okay, you don't have to be there to get it. Just imagine he's saying this to them, okay? He finishes with these words. This is, this is Acts 7, verse 51. You stiff-necked people. Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. I'm not going to explain what that means, but it's not nice. Okay? <laughs> he says, you are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who preached the coming of the righteous one, the coming of Jesus. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You killed Jesus. You who, are, you who receive the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. I mean, he just, oh yeah, and he serves sandwiches to the widows too. I mean, this, guy, this guy's serious. He knows the word and he brings it. And he gets, takes it to their history and says, listen, there's a rebellious heart. Now what he's trying to say is this, listen, you've been waiting for the Messiah. You've been waiting for the Savior of the world. And he came and you missed him and you killed him. Wake up. And so he brings it. How do they respond? Verse 54, when the members of the Sanhedrin, the high court, heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. That means that they clenched their jaws so tight and ground their teeth back and forth together that you could hear the grinding sound with little pieces of teeth breaking off as they're grinding their teeth. It's not a happy thing. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. They began to publicly execute him by pummeling him with stones. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Remember that name, we're gonna come back to him. And now look at verse 59. Verse 59. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Exactly what Jesus said when he was being crucified. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He died. That, that, that was one of the seven people who were called to serve tables and take care of the widows. But when he was questioned, he brought the word of God with clarity and he preached Jesus and they forgot about it and they pushed back on him and they eventually ended up killing him. He never backed off. What, what do you learn from a story like this? Here's lesson number four. Leaders who stand for Jesus with bold confidence will often face serious conflict. You stand for Jesus with bold confidence, you're gonna face conflict. That's going to increase in our world, not just for pastors, not just for church leaders, but for Christians who know what they believe and who stand on it. Don't think that holding to what Jesus calls you to do is always easy because it isn't always easy. It is always right, but it's not always easy. And sometimes we're gonna face those challenging times. Lesson number five. Leaders who follow Jesus will speak the truth even when it is not popular. Leaders who follow Jesus and know the truth of God's word are gonna keep speaking this truth even when it's not popular, even if it costs them ridicule, even if it costs them pressure, even if it costs them their life. And there's places in the world right now where Christians who hold to God's word are actually killed. We don't happen to live in one of those places, but I believe it's gonna get tougher and tougher. And I wanna say something as the pastor of Shoreline Community Church. This is a church that will, that will hold to God's word with tenderness, with humility, and with grace, but with absolute clarity and with no compromise. And, and our world and our culture may change, but in this, in this uncertain world where everything's changing, there's something that doesn't change, and that's God's truth and God's word. And we will preach that word and follow that word and hold to that word, even if there's times where other people don't like it or don't agree. And I run into that periodically as a pastor where people will say, you shouldn't say things like that, and I'll say, I'm preaching the word of God. But that's the reality of what some leaders 
face. And then lesson number six. Leaders who stand strong in their faith will see the face of Jesus. They will sound like Jesus. They will look like Jesus. And maybe even sacrifice like Jesus. If like, if like Stephen, who's called to, to be in a care ministry and help the widows, but man, when the pressure comes, he speaks the word of God. You watch him, and he looks like Jesus. He sounds like Jesus. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It's exactly what Jesus said on the cross. We look more like Jesus. We sound more like Jesus. We're willing to sacrifice like Jesus if we follow him as the leaders he wants us to be in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, at our schools, and at church. But not just at church. Wherever God sends you. Many of you, God has called you to have leadership and influence in the educational world, in the military world, in the political world, in, in, you know, in, in, the, you know, in whatever, whatever your world is, in the entertainment world. All, I mean, there's people showing from every walk of life. But lead and live for Jesus right where he puts you. It won't always go well, but it will always be glorious. Lesson number three. Story, story, story number three. Leaders engage in the mission of Jesus. This is the story of Philip. He, Philip's another one of the seven that's, that's, that gets to do the care and compassion ministry for the widows. And, and so in Philip's story, and this, this story unfolds in chapter eight, uh, the, the Holy Spirit says to Philip, okay, I want you to go to the certain location. So he goes there, because you follow when God leads. And then, then says, okay, follow that chariot, stay up with it, and the chariot's kind of moving along, so he's kind of jogging along next to this chariot, Staying up with it because God said, follow along. And as he's doing that, this, this eunuch who's in there who had come to worship but didn't fully know who Jesus was but was spiritually seeking and spiritually hungry, he's kind of jogging along next to him and he hears him reading the Bible. He's reading from the prophet Isaiah. And Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy says, how can I understand if someone doesn't explain? And the guy says, well, come up into my chariot. And Philip's like, thank you. Uh, and so he climbs up into the chariot, gets to ride along with him now. And, and, and it's, it's, it's powerful. If you have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 8, I want you, I want you to see this because it's just amazing. Um, he, you know, he runs up to the chariot. How can I understand? And, he's, and he's read, so he says, what are you reading? Look at verse 32. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. So this guy just happens to be there and God happens to call him there and here's what he's reading, trying to figure this out. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. This is a prophecy about Jesus. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Who's Isaiah talking about? Himself or someone else? Listen to this. Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. He wasn't just serving tables. He knew the scriptures. He knew Isaiah. He knew the Bible. So he starts to explain the fulfillment of the prophets that was found in Jesus the Christ. What do you learn from this story? And again, go back and read it closely and read it in detail. What do you learn? Lesson number seven. God is always prompting and directing. True leaders listen and follow. God is always moving. God is always directing. Hey, care for that person. Be sensitive to this over here. Connect with that person. Keep your eyes open. God, if, you're, if you'll listen and be aware, God is leading. Leaders, listen and follow as the Lord leads. Be open to God's directing and guiding by his Holy Spirit. And lesson number eight. The gospel and the scriptures are, the heart, are on the heart and the lips of a true leader. If you are going to lead for Jesus, if you want to lead your children or your grandchildren, your nieces and your nephews, you've got to know the word of God. It's got to be on your heart. It's got to be on your lips. Open this book faithfully, daily, and read what it says. And when it doesn't make sense, hang in there and stick with it because God is teaching you and God is instructing you. And if you're gonna lead in the church, you better know the word of God. And if you're gonna lead in your business, you better know the word of God. It will guide you, it will direct you, and it will give you wisdom. Keep it on your heart and on your lips. Story number four. Leaders come from surprising places. Saul, who became Paul. Acts chapter 9. Remember back when Stephen is being stoned, when he's being executed publicly, beat to death by stones. All the people are taking their coats. They don't want to get them all splattered with blood. They're taking their outer cloaks, and they're laying it by this guy who's watching the coats. His name is Saul. He's orchestrating and leading this whole process of this execution. And this guy, Saul, goes on to basically get permission to persecute Christians all over the world at that point. He hates Christians. 
But, but something happens in his life. Look with me at chapter 9 of Acts, verse 1. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest, and he asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, that's the way of Jesus, the Christian faith, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. He was destroying churches. He was having Christians killed. He was brutal. This guy, Saul, this hater of Christians, this persecutor, he met Jesus on the road to Damascus when he was heading there. You gotta read it. Read Acts chapter nine, it's powerful. He encounters Jesus and through a whole process, he's, he's humbled, he comes to see that Jesus is the one he's persecuting and, and he comes to see Jesus as the Messiah and he becomes a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, here, here's the lesson. Jesus can call anyone to be a leader in his church. Anyone. Saul had his name changed to Paul. And there's 27 books. In the, in the New Testament of our Bible, there's 27 books. 13 of them were written by Saul, who became Paul. 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament were written by a guy who killed Christians and destroyed churches. Who can God use as a leader? What's the answer? Anybody. Even you. And even me. And we have all of our reasons why God can't use us. The Apostle Paul later on said, I'm the worst of all sinners. He said, if God could use a sinner like me, he can use anybody. Don't exclude yourself. Don't take, you off, take yourself off the list of people that God can use to bless others and to bless his church because God can use anybody. Lesson number 10. Greatness in leadership comes from humble following. The best leaders are the best followers. The best leaders understand the humility of under, knowing that they have so much to learn. So when, when Saul became Paul and started his ministry, there's not a lot of detail in the Bible, but it's there. He is called away to Arabia for three years, kind of taken out of the public limelight, and he's trained and mentored and equipped and learns how to be a Christian leader. He didn't just do it, he didn't just do it, on, he didn't just take off, okay, now I'm gonna start, he, he did start preaching Jesus, but he needed to be pulled away and be shaped and formed. We need people to pour into our lives to mentor us. I have people in my life now and always have since I've been a Christian who, who I've looked to, who've taught me, mentored me, helped me. Good leaders are good students. They're always learning, they're always growing. And the higher your role of leadership, the more you better get on your knees and be humble. Because pride can take over and that can destroy your leadership. So God make us humble and God make us students and God make us learners. And then, the final story. Leaders lead leaders. Priscilla, Aquila, and Apollos. And in Acts chapter 18, uh, there's this great story where this, this young leader, Apollos, is coming in and he's passionate and he's gifted, but he doesn't have everything all right as a leader, which none of us do. But look at Acts 18, beginning in verse 24. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he, he was effective, but he didn't know everything. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home, and explain to him the way of God more adequately. He was doing good, but he wasn't doing the best he could. So this husband and wife team, Priscilla and Aquila, take him and train and equip him and get him on the right track. They say, listen, you've got, you're doing good, but you've got to learn to really clear, clarify some of your understanding. There was training, there was equipping. So two final lessons. Lesson number 11. Leaders know a lot, but they don't know everything. Someone say Amen. Leaders know a lot, but they don't know everything. I love to preach. I've been, learning, I've been growing as a preacher through the years, but almost every single Sunday, after I preach at first service, we're at second service here, but at first service, after first service, there's about four or five people that sit me down and they kind of will say, okay, you can do this better, slow down here. You get, I get excited, I get going fast sometimes. You probably don't notice that. But um, <laughs> I love God, so I get so excited and I get all revved up. But they'll say, you know, slow down here or you gotta be more clear here. And almost every week, there's a couple people that will tell me how to do a better job. My wife's one of them, Pastor Dennis is one of them, Pastor Ben, Pastor Sean. Um, we've got a team of people that, that, and this week I think I had three or four things, right? Is that about right, three or four? So this, my sermon's better now because they straightened me out. 
Um, by the third service, I'll have it right. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but here, here's the thing. We don't have it all figured out. We have a lot to learn. So as you lead, let other people teach and speak into your life. Ask them their opinion. Ask them per their perspective. How can I do a better job? I become better because the people around me have perspective I don't have, and they instruct me, and they guide me, and they help me become better. And then lesson number 12. God's gifts are for men and for women. You have Priscilla and Aquila as a ministry team that are partners with the Apostle Paul doing the ministry. Here at Shoreline, we believe that every spiritual gift is available to men and to women. Now, I, I believe, biblically, I believe that men and women are absolutely equal. When God made the heavens and the earth, he made a man and a woman, and they together made the fullness of what would reveal the image of God. We're not identical. I don't believe men and women are identical physiologically. I mean, I don't think that God's made us the same. As a matter of fact, I think he's made us so that we actually together make the fullness of what he wants us to be. But, but they're, they're, all of the gifts are unleashed in all of God's people. I love the fact that my wife and I team are on staff together at Shoreline Church. I'm on, I'm on staff page. She's on staff volunteer, but we're on staff together. I love that we, we help with Pastor Walt and others to lead Organic Outreach International, Pastor Tom and Robin, and, but my wife and I get to be part of that together. There's something about God bringing men and women together with their, with their different gifts for the glory of Jesus. So whether you're a man or a woman, whether, you, whether you're a new believer or a longtime believer, whether you came from a pretty good background or you were killing Christians before you became a Christian, like the Apostle Paul, Whatever your background, God says, I will gift you, I will use you. Will you follow me? Will you let me work through you and lead through you for the glory of Jesus? Oh, Jesus, we pray today that every single one of us that has come to the cross and received your grace and received your forgiveness and been filled with your Holy Spirit, God, we pray that you would use us. We, we, we surrender ourselves to you. We surrender our excuses to you why we can't lead, why we can't serve, why we can't be used by you. We, we surrender our time to you. I'm too busy. We surrender all the reasons why we can't to the God who says, in my power, you can. So Lord, as we respond right now, hear our prayer that I surrender all to Jesus. And Lord, let us remind us, let's even in our mind as we sing this song, may we think of children and grandchildren, nieces and nephews, children at the church here, friends that are watching us as we walk with you. As they walk with us, let them walk with you, Jesus. Use us to lead others closer to you in a formal ministry or just in the flow of a normal day. Will you make this your prayer with me? We're gonna sing a simple chorus. I'm gonna ask you to make this your prayer, to surrender yourself to God that he could use you. Time surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. If you're able to stand, will you stand with us and will you sing this as a prayer? Lift your voice to God. Make this your prayer. Surrender yourself to him. Let's sing together.
every moment and every day.